Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, very wise words. Um, I agree with just about everything you said. Uh, coming from, uh, I'm a journalist who has worked 30 years, uh, mm. half my time at the national broadcaster, the ABC, where I first started. Uh, probably the first uh, unpronounceable surname that any of the ABC mm. white news readers ever had to read out. Um, and also working at SBS, and just correct you on one thing, we do send our students who come from very many migrant backgrounds to the ABC and SBS as interns, and hopefully to NITV as well yeah. soon. So, now, as, as a journalist who's worked um, in the mainstream press, the ABC and um, multicultural press, um, multicultural media, uh, SBS, uh, mm. Our holy grail is the Walkley Award. You know, we work so hard and once a year we all get frocked up and we go to uh, a fabulous hotel and we, we drink a lot and, and we pat each other on the back and we get a, an award if we've done a good job. I got one, thank God. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and that's our reward. Uh, but there's never been anything to reward the ethnic press, the journalists who who I think are the unsung heroes because of the very, very important role they play uh, in integration of ethnic communities. Now, as it's been said already, uh, there was an award, the inaugural award last year, and there's another one this year, and that is 165 years since the establishment of the country's first ethnic newspaper, the German language Deutsche Post in Adelaide, better late than never, mm -hmm. um, but it begs the question, why has it taken so long to acknowledge the work of these people? Um, and, you know, in terms of their role in helping the integration and helping carve out a role for uh, people of an ethnic Australian identity. So why has it taken so long? Let me get personal here. I want to speak from experience. I was born in Greece. I'm a migrant. I'm of the first generation. I was born in Greece in a small village in the mountainous wetlands of the north. Yes, it's a very different Greece. We weren't all born on islands. <laughs> <laughs> My parents were <coughs> peasant farmers who grew some beans and had a few sheep and realised that they would never, ever prosper in a country that was dangerously divided and polarised by the Greek Civil War. They were pawns in this geopolitical game, the Cold War, etc., etc. So they decided to do what is considered to be one of the most stressful and traumatic things that any human being will ever do in their lives. They left everything they knew, everyone they knew, and moved to the other side of the world, to a foreign country, a foreign culture, and started all over again. I don't need to tell you about that. I can see from your faces that most of you have experienced that or your families have too. The year was 1965 and in the month of April, after journeying on a ship called Patris, <laughs> homeland, we arrived in Adelaide. We were known as aliens. Yes, that was on the paperwork. I grew up looking at this, the Aliens Act. Am I an alien? <laughs> yes, I am. Some of the people from the village had arrived before us and they helped us. My father got a job the very next day at James Hardy's Asbestos. That's a, the topic of another conference. Let's not go into that. I started school within a week. We rented a bedroom in the family home of Greeks we'd never met before, but we found a welcoming Greek community in the heart of Port Adelaide. Soon there was Greek school. Ah, that's another story. Greek dances, Greek movies at the local Greek cinema, and we also went to watch a lot of Bollywood movies. Um, in the Greek cinema because they looked more like us than what we saw on <laughs> television or what we saw in the media. The community wrapped itself up in nostalgia for comfort and sustenance. And of course, we started to exist in a time warp. As time passed and society changed in Australia and in Greece, our Greece remained frozen in 1965. So how did these Greek adults negotiate the outside world? If they were working around the clock, and yes, my parents took shifts, one in the morning and one worked at night, so there'd always be someone home. I was an only child, still am. They were too busy, they struggled with English classes, but really you had to earn a living because we had to get out of that front bedroom and get our own place. So how did they, they socialised with like-minded Greeks. But how did they deal with the council? 
for the government instrumentalities, the doctors, the outside English-speaking world? Well, let me tell you from experience. We, that army of seven, eight and nine-year-olds, we did it, the girls and boys, the go-betweens, because we went to school and we, we spoke the language. We had to go to offices and we had to speak to public servants. Excuse me, sir, my dad didn't speak English very well and we can't understand this form. Can you please explain it to me? Excuse me, doctor, my mother doesn't speak English well. She has a pain here. Yes, we translated, we interpreted, we tried to fill in tax forms, we met bank managers, we went to the post office, etc., etc. That was the difficult burden of an ethnic childhood. There's a PhD in that, I am sure. But we didn't do it all ourselves. That's where the role of the ethnic press comes in. And for us, it was the Greek newspapers. The Hellenic Herald, Neos Cosmos, Danaea. That Greek newspaper became the lifeline to the outside world, the world apart from work and family. We used to go shopping once a week to the supermarket. My father would get the Greek newspaper. He'd spend the weekend catching up on what was happening around the world. It was his lifeline. Then he'd give it to my uncle, and my uncle would swap his Greek newspaper. And that's how they became informed. It was through the ethnic press that they were connected and got news from home. The colonel's coup, the crisis, the Cold War. That's how they knew what was happening in the outside world. And even more importantly, the ethnic press, those Greek newspapers, provided news for them, about them. And there was a lot happening. The church versus the community. Multiculturalism, the election of Gough Whitlam, their rights within the new policy of multiculturalism. It was the Greek press that explained what was happening to them, explained to them that they had certain rights. Because once they became Australian citizens, they could vote. They had some power. Information was power. The ethnic media provided that information and assisted in communication and enabled them to engage with Australia and to participate. And along the way, it also helped create an identity that was locally grown. And this is just so important and we tend not to acknowledge it. Yes, we got a television in 1971, but we soon realised that we were actually invisible. No one on the TV news covered us, unless we did something wrong. <laughs> All the Australian stories were white and Anglo, and no one on the soapies looked like us. Now, as Gary said, perhaps uh, no one in the Australian soapies still looks like us. And that wonderful uh, Australian story program on the ABC that delights and disappoints me still looks very much like a white Australian story. If one in four Australians are born overseas, are one in four Australian stories about us? Not really. I watch every week in hope, occasionally, and they're catching up and you're right. The faces are changing, but what about the people who make decisions? And what's very interesting is, of course, the ABC just got $10 million from the government. Let's see what they do with that $10 million. Don't be surprised if they actually appoint a foreign correspondent from Western Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's get back to 1971. Soon there was Greek community radio. And then the arrival, half an hour earlier in Adelaide, we say, but unfortunately it's, it's usually a decade later that <laughs> things come to Adelaide. But SBS, the arrival of SBS, multicultural television. That was then. What is happening to the ethnic press now? The mainstream newspapers, we know, are in crisis. Revenues move to the internet, the newspapers are moving online and putting up paywalls. Is that the model for the ethnic media? I really don't think so because I think that you have a different business model, the advertising is different, you have a niche market. But it also depends on whether you're part of an older, more established ethnic community uh, and no longer being replenished with new migrants and new readers and new viewers. Or whether you're one of the communities that is receiving migrants and growing, like the Chinese, Indian and Arabic press. The Greek, Italian and the older ethnic media audience is facing the problems of ageing. 
It's a bit like the Australian RSLs. <laughs> With no new members, the future could be bleak. Some papers have heeded the call and they have English supplements and others have gone online in an attempt to capture the younger generation, a generation that has so much choice already and that success will depend on whether you provide that content to them that is interesting, that really speaks to them. But I think the biggest threat to the ethnic press, as Pino has said, comes from overseas, the Trojan horse of satellite television. Yes, it has its benefits. The old country is no longer frozen in time because you can see it in real time, 24 hours a day. But if the ethnic press help new migrants engage with Australia, satellite te television has the potential to disengage. Let, let me get personal here again. How could this happen? My parents have a satellite television dish. They get six Greek television stations direct from Athens without leaving their couch or their remote. ERT, ERT, Mega, Alpha, Star, Sky and Antenna. They wake up in the morning to a show called Morning Coffee. That's sunrise on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> or there's The Greek Hour. How about a morning movie? Yes, let's hatch, catch a morning movie. Mid-morning Greek news, bit of sport, bit more news. Then there's Greek current affairs, which needs to be seen to be believed. <laughs> Greek Q&A. Tony Jones, you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> and then there's the weather, the Greek weather. We need to know what's hap what the weather's like in Greece. <laughs> there's astrology. Then it's back for more news. And believe me, the news from Athens is never good these days. <laughs> it brings up my father's blood pressure, <laughs> railing at the television looking at my mother, now I know why we left Vicky. <laughs> and then we settle in for the night, a smorgasbord, smorgasbord of M Greek master chef, mama's Greek kitchen, Greek dancing with the stars, Greek idol, Greek movies, <laughs> Greek wheel of fortune, Greek home renovation, <laughs> Greek big brother, Greek getaway, etc., etc., etc. Now they may be more well informed than they have ever been before. My mother told me the other day, you must eat blueberries. Purple fruit's very good for you. <laughs> she didn't hear that on Sunrise. She heard it on Greek television. <laughs> but the sad news is that my father no longer buys a Greek newspaper. That is sad. And that may be OK for him, the Greek population. They've paid their taxes. They're on the pension. They're retired. They've done, they've, they've, they've integrated. But what if you've just arrived here? What if you've just migrated to Australia? You feel alienated, everything's foreign, you get nostalgic satellite television to the rescue. You can connect immediately with your homeland and it puts you straight into the comfort zone. You are part of a transnational community. Who needs to engage locally? You get all your entertainment, your cultural needs from your satellite dish. This is called soft power. There are no armies, there are no invasions, it's all virtual. Another country is capturing the hearts and minds of people living on the other side of the world. Now, governments from France to the Netherlands to Germany are taking this very seriously indeed. Scholars are studying the effects of satellite television on, this new, on new virtual ghettos and the disengagement from the host country. A few weeks ago, the Iranian satellite channels were taken off air in Europe. The providers said it was an order from the European Union. The European Union blamed the providers. Iran is not happy, it's getting serious. The need for a homegrown ethnic media has never been more important than it is now. To interpret, to analyse, to provide a moderate voice in this globalised world of transnational identities. So, 165 years after the first ethnic newspaper was published in Australia, I think it's really important to give credit to those people who've paved the way for all these communities and helped them to create a very important Australian ethnic identity. Thank you. Thank you.